at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Colombia's uh, CIPA. And today we're going to discuss with this amazing panel, where is Latin America's energy transition standing and some of the challenges and opportunities for transitioning for its low carbon future. We will try to delve into the politics and policies of this transition, which largely means building large amounts of infrastructure at a massive scale and a very fast pace. Uh, this entails a number of challenges from financing to social and environmental impacts and from local communities in the Atacama Desert to geopolitics. So um, please note that this event is being webcasted live and the full video will be available online in the upcoming days. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And as a remind, reminder, our events are closed captioned and you can turn the captions on by clicking uh, the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So please allow me before uh, starting to introduce briefly our uh, amazing panel. So first of all, I will go with our uh, panelists that unfortunately cannot join us here today live and is now sitting in Santiago de Chile. Juan Carlos Jobe, he's a distinguished visiting fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy, and he's also dean at the School of Business at the Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez uh, in Santiago, Chile. Then we got to my left, Mauricio Cárdenas, who is a professor of professional practice in global leadership at Columbia University School uh, of International and Public Affairs. He's a director of the MPA in global leadership, and he's also a global senior research fellow at Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy and has an extensive career in the professional service in Colombia, his country. Um, and then we got to his left, Luisa Palacios, who is a senior research scholar at CGF as well, and has a, a long uh, career in the intersection of financial markets, policy and research. And finally, to her left, we got Brian Winter, who is an editor-in-chief in America's Quarterly and a written expert and journalist in Latin American affairs. So without further ado, please um, allow me to start with uh, a question that probably um, we, could, uh, we could give the, the word first to Juan Carlos. So some countries in the region have announced uh, ambitious emissions reduction goals and carbon neutrality targets, but, no, but only a few of them have clear and detailed strategies on how to achieve them. Where is Latin America standing today in terms of their goals, targets, and actual progress on the energy transition? and which are the main challenges today uh, for this transition. So Juan Carlos, if you can please go ahead for a couple of minutes and then we can uh, give the word here. Well, thank you, Diego. Hello everyone in New York. It's, it's great to see you. Uh, it's a shame I couldn't join you face to face, uh, but choose from Santiago de Chile as, as Diego said. Well, I, I would say the uh, Latin America, sometimes it's seen from the developed world as a kind of uh, one consistent block of countries. The reality is, and this is the first point, I think the reality in Latin America, as in many other areas uh, regarding climate change, is, is mixed. There is a, a big diversity among different countries in the region. Uh, most countries have uh, NDCs, uh, some of them very ambitious, that is the case, I, I would say, Colombia, Chile, I, I would put in that in that uh, group. Some other countries are less ambitious in terms of, of climate goals. Some countries have carbon neutrality goals or targets by 2050. A few of them, some others don't have. Uh, so I think the, the, the picture is, is pretty much mixed. Uh, I think, though, that the challenges that countries face to make progress on the climate agenda I would, I would say that, that there are three that are shared uh, among different countries. Uh, and I think we, we can, I mean, get deeper into these uh, during the conversation. One of them, I would say, is the political economy of the energy transition. So how do we as countries are able to, at the same time, reduce our emissions and give our people access to a, a reliable and affordable sources of energy? If you look at the numbers worldwide last year, the amount of money that governments uh, gave in subsidies to fossil fuels broke records. I mean, and I'm sure Mauricio can come back to this later, but governments are putting, I mean, huge amount of money to alleviate the budgets of families, especially in a context of economic downturn and high inflation. Uh, so how do we balance that affordability on the one hand, 
and sustainability, on the other hand, is, is a very big challenge. I mean, a lot of people care about uh, climate change, but when we put climate change against affordability and the budget of families, especially in countries unequal and poor like ours, I mean, that is a difficult, I mean, choice for most families. I think that is one big challenge. The second big challenge I see is more purely political challenge. Uh, the, the investments we need to make to navigate a successful energy transition are big infrastructure investments that need long-term horizons and that need stability in policy. And we are a region in which, I mean, political, uh, I mean, governments are changing from one side of the political spectrum to the other side. In some cases, very extreme swings of policy and ideology. And that is a challenge because investors need, I mean, clarity on the rules and they need to make sure that they have a set of rules that will be there for the long run. And if we don't reach broad political agreements on what we want to do, uh, and we change rules every time we change governments, that's gonna hamper our ability to navigate a successful transition. And the third one I would like to, I mean, mention uh, as an initial discussion, it's uh, the technical challenges. So the, the, the region has an enormous uh, amount of good quality natural resources to produce clean electricity, but we are facing challenges in because of the intermittency of renewable sources, the challenges to build the infrastructure we need, like transmission lines, permitting is a big challenge all over the region, I, I would say. Uh, environmental NGOs are concerned about climate change, but they are also concerned about the impact that those projects could have in the local I mean, uh, communities and the local environment. So how do we balance those things uh, when we need to build a lot of stuff? I mean, that is a, a third challenge, which is like, I would say, the technical challenges. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there so, so we can give space to the other ones and we can come back to some of these issues later. Awesome, Juan Carlos, thank you very much. And the idea today is to have a very relaxed uh, conversation and dialogue. So perhaps uh, I will give it to you, Mauricio. Would you agree with what Juan Carlos mentioned, these uh, three key points, three challenges? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks uh, for, for inviting me and uh, thanks to the audience for being here. Um, I, I, uh, I fully agree with what Juan Carlos said. I would just add one point, which is when we talk about uh, emissions in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we always have to be very mindful that um, the composition of emissions is very different uh, between uh, our part of the world and the advanced uh, world. Uh, we tend to talk about energy. Energy is an important part of the conversation here in the US. It's a very important part of the conversation in Europe. But in Latin America, really, when we talk about meeting our NDCs, it's really about ending deforestation. So deforestation is, is the key concept here because uh, land uh, use, land use change, forestry accounts for about 40% of the emissions in the region. Uh, and this is true of almost every country with the important exception of Chile. Uh, Chile has uh, net negative emissions in, in land use because Chile has been making a lot of progress in terms of the reforestation and the conservation um, uh, of the forests. And, uh, and it's in a, in a very unique position in the context of Latin America. But for the rest of the countries, uh, deforestation is, uh, is really the issue to solve. And it is much harder to deal with that problem than with the issues of, say, energy or the electrification of transport. Because uh, although it's, it's uh, costly, there are heavy investments, uh, we already know uh, how to um, transition from uh, uh, combustion, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. We already have you know, made a lot of progress in the region in terms of uh, generating renewable electricity. We're improving our uh, mix, putting more solar, pulling more wind. But the issue that is very hard to deal with, it's, uh, it's deforestation because it touches on a number of issues that involve poverty, in, involve uh, the lack of uh, state capacity, the lack of presence of the state in the areas that are being deforested. 
It involves issues related to illegal activities, illegal mining, illegal drug production. So it is a very complex issue. And, um, and there are high hopes that we can actually change that uh, using markets, um, generating carbon credits, selling the carbon credits. Uh, but there are many, many market failures that make that very difficult. Um, and, uh, and I think unless we really tackle that issue, uh, we're not going to be able to say in 2030, yes, our level of ambition was basically transform into deliverables, into, into outputs, into finally achieving the goals. Uh, it's very likely that we'll say in 2030, well, we made these promises, but uh, we're not going to be able to do it. On average, there are differences, and Juan Carlos said that on average, the Latin American Caribbean countries have pledged to reduce emissions by 34.5%. And that's a very significant number. I mean, if there is something that we do not lack is ambition. We may lack in terms of strategy and we're weak in terms of uh, uh, putting in place everything that is necessary to achieve that, but we have the ambition. But unless we really tackle in a more successful way uh, the issues associated with land use and, uh, and land use change and forestry, we're not gonna achieve the target. This is the, half, the, the, the glass half empty side. On the glass half full side, we in the region are making more progress in the electrification of public transport than many other parts of the world. Santiago de Chile and Bogota have the largest electric buses fleets in the world outside China which is amazing. It's just amazing. It's, it's something that I think we should all feel, you know, that, that, that uh, basically that we have a good story to tell to the world. And of course, because of the history, this is not something new. Our energy mix is, is very clean. And I think that's another big advantage. So I'll stop here just to point that the, the issue that we have to tackle is, is a very difficult issue. And it's an issue that involves many dimensions, but, but it's, it's an issue that requires, you know, different from buying an electric vehicle, it, it requires state capacities, which is something that we in the region really uh, have a lot of room for improvement. Very interesting, Mauricio. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add anything, Luisa? Well, it's difficult to follow uh, to, uh, uh, to speak after Juan Carlos yes, and Mauricio. Yes, after Juan Carlos and Mauricio, but I'll try. Um, so um, I am going to add three other concepts. The first one is one of the challenges and also of the opportunities of the energy transition is that we have to do also everything sustainably. And so <laughs> solutions, of, so we have a in, in Latin America, um, a, one of the cleanest uh, uh, electrical, electric mix, uh, power mix. Um, but we have a lot of hydro uh, as well. And so there's uh, also concerns about water use. And so in Latin America, we are sitting on a fantastic reserves of critical minerals, but there are some issues and some challenges about developing them because we have to do it in a sustainable way. In Latin America, and particularly in Brazil, we are we have very rich biofuels. It was a solution in the 1970s and 1980s in relation to energy security. It is definitely part of the solution of the energy transition and has a role to play, but it has to be done sustainably. So we have a lot of resources. We just, uh, and sometimes we think, why is this not working better? Why is, are we not attracting more investments? Why are we not uh, um, uh, growing more? Why is there no more uh, 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 um, spillover effects? And I think it's what's missing in this story is the concept of sustainability um, that we have to now, and sustainability is about institutions. It's about, okay, you have 80% uh, uh, or 90% of your power mix is renewable, Give me the certificate, prove that you can do that. I want to trace it to the you know, end of the supply chain. So it's a different way to do business. And it's the second point, also a different way to do policy. Um, Latin America has uh, been, I think, uh, because we have been endowed with natural resources, we have also created institutions uh, that pretty much uh, tax those rents. Um, and so the energy transition is about the deglobalization of energy. And a lot of our countries in Latin America are exporters of energy and particularly fossil fuels. 
So we have to change completely our mindset that the way that we are, uh, that we're gonna live or, or the way we insert ourselves in the global economy is uh, a very different form of fiscal revenues. It's not taxing rents that you are so lucky to have. It's about generating growth and then taxing that growth in any case, but it is a very different mindset. The last thing is that the energy transition is also about having a different understanding about our markets. Um, a lot of the technologies have to do uh, with creating demand at home. And, and I love an example of actually a national company uh, that in trying to foster uh, hydrogen, uh, low carbon hydrogen, green hydrogen, which is in Colombia, is using its refineries uh, uh, as a way to, okay, let me use the balance sheet of the old economy to try to generate uh, uh, and promote and sponsor the new economy. And that I think is, uh, gets me to my last point, which is the political economy of transitions in Latin America also implied the risk of reversals. And so for national companies, which are many in Latin America, not to be in the way of the energy transition, we have to think about a way in which we use the balance sheet uh, and we use the demand capabilities of uh, the, the current energy sector uh, in order to foster uh, and promote the new economy. Excellent, Luisa. Very interesting. And I would love to, to pick up on, on two topics to later touch on them, critical minerals and, and the fiscal revenues coming from traditional energy. But before that, I would love to go a little bit on, the, on politics. And probably to do that, uh, Brian, I think you, we, we should probably start with you before going with the former politicians. And that way you can, you can give us a, the energy transition in, in, in many geographies, including in the US, for instance, has been uh, you know, attached to, to certain ideologies, right? Like the right often it does not agree is, is, is the case here. The left kind of fits more on the energy transition. Do you feel that that is the case of the, of the energy transition in Latin America? And where, and you know, let's, it's a diverse region. So please, what do you think? Of course, no, thank you for the question. And, and thank you, Luisa, Mauricio, Juan Carlos. It's a, a privilege to be part of this spectacular panel. Um, this is another issue in Latin America where the left-right framework tells us almost nothing. Um, there are leaders on the ideological right that have actually embraced the energy transition. Uh, I would cite uh, Luis Lacalle Po, the president of Uruguay, who as recently as June announced a big $4 billion investment to be done by a U.S. firm, um, half of that for green hydrogen half of it for wind and solar. Uh, Ivan Duque until 2022, also of the center right or right, was a president who did a lot in terms of methane pledges and also diversification of the energy matrix in Colombia. On the other hand, on the other side of the ledger, also within the right, you have Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, and then you have Javier Millet uh, in Argentina, who, who is the front runner to now be elected president there, who has said that climate change is a quote unquote socialist hoax. If you look at the left, um, you have some leaders who have been pretty good, who've made uh, climate change and the energy transition a priority. I would name um, Gabriel Boric uh, of Chile. Uh, I would point to Petro and uh, Colombia, Gustavo Petro, who has not delivered much in the way of results on that front, but certainly talks about it as if it's important. Uh, and then also on the left, you have Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador uh, in Mexico, uh, who has been widely perceived as deeply negative for renewable energy. And you have Lula uh, in Brazil, who um, has been very good on deforestation, uh, who also Brazil starts from an advantageous position. It has, it's one of the countries that has the highest mix of renewables as far as its energy matrix. It's about 83%, but has not spoken much about wind and solar. It's not something that's been a, a huge part of his government so far. Um, and is in the process of making uh, renewed bets on offshore oil. So, you know, it's clear that left right is not the dividing line. And I've thought a lot about, based on those leaders, what seems to be the dividing line? So if you think about it, the people I mentioned, Lacaille, Po, um, Duque, Boric, 
Anybody want to guess? I wonder if it's age. Because all of those people I just named are under 50, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and there may be a generational split, as with so many other things, that's more about life experience and kind of the world in which they came up, as opposed to um, left-right ideology. Now, obviously, like so much else, uh, it's not definitive. And I don't want to in any way imply that just because anyone is above a certain age that they're not capable of embracing this issue. But it is interesting as we look at that, that that's kind of the way it plays out. I had one other point I wanted to make on this, but Juan Carlos already made it, which is that even though the left-right divide doesn't tell us that much about um, how leaders feel about this issue, it does end up holding the energy transition prisoner in some ways because of that volatility that that divide generates and the fact that the risk that you're gonna have these lurches from one side to the other in a short time. I would cite what's happening in Chile right now where President Boric just announced relatively recently a new framework for lithium um, exploration. And he is uh, having a very difficult moment right now in his presidency. I mean, most of his presidency, he's had very low approval ratings. I think last I checked, he's somewhere below 30%. Um, the right is newly ascendant. And I know, uh, I've heard that there are companies that are waiting to make bets on the lithium sector in Chile because they believe that some flavor of the ideological right will come to power in the next election in 2025 and change the rules once again. And so that's, that's just one example of how sometimes politics, even though there's this consensus in some ways, it still ends up being held prisoner by that left-right divide. Right, thank you, Brian. I wonder, is there any quick reaction to this, uh, guys? Shall we? Uh... I have one. I, I was Sorry, I, I can't resist. <laughs> the, the, I would just only add President Pinera uh -huh. as a center-right president who was very in favor of climate policy. Uh, and he's over 70, by the way. So in that case, the age rule doesn't apply. It kills the age theory. <laughs> and Millet, Millet also kills it on the other side, I, I believe, right? I run 50s, no? Like, I think... Uh... 52. Well, that's young by today's politi political standards. Right. But it's a, it's a very interesting uh, way of putting it. So let's... That, it, I mean, now that Juan Carlos... The politicians I coming I in. <laughs> um, we have to separate two things here. It's, it's climate, the concern about climate. And, and yes, the divide that you mentioned is very clear. Um, it's not left or right. There is another element in this conversation, which is the role of fossil fuels. So yes, you have Lula very committed to climate, taking a very ambitious agenda in terms of the preservation of the Amazon, for example, convening a summit of the other presidents of the Amazon basin countries, now thinking about forming the OPEP of, uh, of uh, countries that own and have uh, basically rainforest or tropical forest, but yet at the same time, a big defender of the oil industry because of the strategic role it plays for the economy, uh, for, for Brazil, the idea that Brazil is going to be producing by the end of this decade about 5 million barrels of oil per day, which will put Brazil into the top oil producers in the world. So you have that element there, which is it's, it's, yes, uh, climate, but at the same time, defending the oil business and the oil industry because it's a strategic industry for, for Brazil and for and making Brazil more influential in the world. Lopez Obrador, that does not get involved and interested, and the NDCs from Mexico are, you know, quite uh, weak, is also an example of someone who is very much in favor. Of, uh, of the fossil fuel industry and wants to empower Pemex and, uh, and reduce the private sector participation in the energy sector. And then you have climate activists like Petro that talks a lot about climate, but uh, at the same time, his, his main discourse is really against fossil fuel. It's essentially saying that countries like Colombia should stop uh, exploration and should uh, uh, reduce uh, investment in, in those sectors. So 
there is there is there is this two dimensional element here climate and then your your attitude and your beliefs regarding the fossil fuel industry and it makes it makes the whole equation uh, much more complex and 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 difficult to grasp. So you see, it's uh, it's not left, it's not right, it's not just climate. Some are climate plus, yes, on fossil fuels, and others are climate plus, not basically not incentivizing the fossil fuel industry. That's a great segue, exactly on what I uh, what I got next to Alex Morris here, which is basically. Uh, thank you. Um, which is basically um, that Latin America has um, many resources, including critical minerals on, on the one hand, fabulous renewable potential, wind, solar, but at the same time, it's also full with many countries that not only have vast fossil fuel resources, but also are important exporters on the one hand, and also those resources represent, as you said, an important source of revenue for those countries. So in this mix, could you talk a little bit more about like, what are these strategies and how does this would look in the future, kind of like these trade-offs and these possible winners and losers perhaps. And I wonder if you guys wanna join a little bit, uh, a couple of thoughts on, on that. I already spoke too much yeah. about this. So, <laughs> so the, the thing, I think uh, Mauricio, by presenting this in terms of uh, fossil fuels uh, countries uh, is, is uh, putting into the debate a very interesting point, which is how do countries that export uh, and pr produce and export fossil fuel, how do those um, voters feel about it? Um, because I think uh, that we have not yet seen that very clearly, but we just had an example in Ecuador, right? And so is this going to be part of the politics of the energy transition uh, in terms of what is the role that we think uh, fossil fuels should have in our economy? So my, my sense is that this is something that politicians are going to have to grapple with, uh, um, how to uh, discuss this. And last week, the discussion in Brazil was about um, should Petrobras really be doing exploration near the Amazon River? Um, or in the in the offshore, but uh, not very far. So this is a this is a real discussion. It is generating a lot of debate. I don't think uh, uh, there is that much problem uh, uh, from the voters' perspective in relation to Priso. That's very far away from a politics perspective. Is uh, it's not like Ecuador. I, I mean, forty percent about forty percent of Ecuador's resources are oil resources are in the Amazon. Uh, uh, in sorry, in the jungle of uh, Ecuador. The same is true for Peru. Uh, there's a lot. Argentina doesn't have that issue. Vaca Muerta is really not near any kind of jungle. And so, where your resources are is going to impact the political economy of developing those resources. So that's one thing. The second thing is that the role of the national company. So Petrobras is perceived to be one of the most, if I can say sustainable, uh, uh, if that is possible, but it is a company that has a ESG report, sustainability report. It has a very low carbon intensity. It, it's investing in reducing the carbon intensity of that oil. Crystal is one of the least carbon, uh, uh, it has one of the lowest carbon footprints as part of the Middle East. Uh, it is also a, a company that is developed, CC, it's one of the only countries in the emerging markets outside of the Middle East that is developing CCUS, which is carbon capture, storage, and utilization. No other country in Latin America is doing that. Petrobras is doing that. Why do you think? So when I look at the international companies and their strategy, they're leaving a lot of places. Why do you think they're leaving a lot of places? They are optimizing their portfolio. They're leaving uh, the places where they think the carbon intensity is, gonna, is too high because they are also shifting. Uh, however, gradually and not doing it enough, whatever you think, I am looking at optimization of portfolios and a lot of companies leaving certain places. They're not leaving Brazil because Brazil offers that kind of carbon intensity of low carbon intensity. So it, it, that's not the case of Mexico. Mexico right now is one of the highest uh, uh, methane intensity barrels that you can see in, in Latin America, in the world, by the way. And so, and we have a very important report published by our colleague, Adrian Duhalt in relation to that. And so I think it's, it's also depends on state capabilities. It depends on where the national company is. It depends on the resource and the resource base that you have. 
Um, and it also depends on your borders and where that oil is. Is it onshore? Is it offshore? Is it near the Amazon? It's so symbolic. Are you really going to drill near the Amazon? So it's, it's that kind of thing that I think is entering the debate. Great, excellent. Any additional thoughts, uh, Juan Carlos, yes? Yeah, thanks, Diego. I just wanna emphasize what Lisa was saying at the end. Uh, the location of the resources is very important and it, it influences, I mean, I mean, our capabilities to take advantage of those. One example that comes to mind is in Chile, we have huge potential to produce green hydrogen. And that is, I mean, in many areas of the country, but especially in the north, in the Atacama Desert and in the stream south in Patagonia. And uh, I think companies are facing much stronger resistance from NGOs, environmental NGOs in the south, in, in Patagonia, right? Than in the, in the midst of the Atacama Desert. I mean, still they are having challenges in Atacama, but it's much harder to produce or to develop projects in Patagonia than it is in Atacama, right? Uh, and the other thing I want to mention briefly is critical minerals. And that, you mentioned that in your, in your question, Diego. So uh, lithium and copper, especially, those are two very, very important minerals for the energy transition. And Latin America has an enormous potential and responsibility, I would say, in both, right? So Chile, uh, Argentina, Bolivia have enormous resources in lithium. Uh, and we're struggling to take advantage of those. And we can come back to that later. Uh, and, uh, and copper. I don't think we talk enough about copper when we talk about critical minerals. We talk a lot about lithium, nickel, cobalt, and others, uh, but copper is essential. I mean, the, the, the essence of the, of the energy transition is electrifying, as we know, electrifying energy consumption. And that means a lot of copper cables, right? for transmission lines, for renewable energy, uh, for even for electric vehicles, we need a lot of copper. And Chile and Peru produce around 40% of the world's copper, and it's getting very, very difficult to develop new copper mines in the region. We were saying earlier that it's hard, hard to get permits and the approval of local communities to develop renewable energy projects. That is even harder to produce, uh, to develop new copper mines. I think people reasonably have the perception based on history, uh, and in some cases still, I mean, that's the way mining companies operate today, that mining hurts the environment. I mean, and that is true. But how do we solve that, that, that tension, that trade-off? Because without copper, without lithium, the, the energy transition will slow down, and the, the climate probably will get worse. I mean, and we're going to hurt the environment while we were trying to, to protect it. I mean, and I, and I think that comes back to the, a point we mentioned earlier, but I think it's very important. We need to build a lot of stuff to navigate a successful energy transition. Uh, and I think environmental NGOs kind of understand that rationally. They kind of understand that, but I don't think they have been able to translate that understanding into a different way to approach projects. How do they participate in the project development to make sure that those comply with more stringent uh, standards, but that they don't, I mean, prevent those projects from being built because that, that is a big problem. And I think in Latin America, we're facing that. Uh, and minerals is an area in which we can align both the economic, I mean, development and growth of the region with doing the right thing for the environment. I mean, for climate change. Uh, but I think that it, that requires a lot of policy making and conversations because the challenges there are enormous. Just let me, and I'll stop here, let me give you one, one number. The, the copper production estimated for Chile for 2030, 40% of that production will exist only if we invest a portfolio of around $65 billion between now and 2030. That's huge. And we produce a quarter of the world's copper, right? So that's a big challenge, I, I would say. And I don't think we talked enough about that. Awesome. Th thank you very much, Juan Carlos. Ryan, I know you want to say a couple of things, Chris. Talking a little bit more about this offshore oil in Brazil, I think, because it takes so much of you know, this theoretical question and puts it in real life practice decisions that are happening right now. This is an oil find that is projected to be, according to Petrobras, as many as uh, 14 billion 
barrels of oil. Um, it's uh, about 350 miles away from the edge of the Amazon River. And Lula was asked about this when he was in New Delhi last week. And he said, just translating, he says, if they find the wealth that one supposes exists there, then it's a decision of state whether you're going to uh, exploit it or not. But listen to this. He says, but look, <laughs> it's an exploration that's going to happen 575 kilometers away from the river. It's not something that's right next to the Amazon. That sounds like a guy who wants to drill. And um, it could break apart part of his government because Marina Silva, his environmental minister, who's iconic and marched for Brazil and the Olympic procession and uh, is overseeing this very successful reduction of deforestation that has surprised me and a lot of other people so far in 2023 with this 40% decline they've seen has made very clear that she sees no justification for this because of reasons of the environment, because of reasons I think Mauricio, you alluded to, branding. Like, is it worth it for the country who that sees itself as a green superpower, to take a phrase that you hear a lot in Brazil, and that wants to build its entire 21st century around that economy, does it make sense for it to be drilling in the Amazon River Basin? It's a tough decision. I, I you know, especially for a country that um, has had a stagnant economy for 10 years now, for a country that had uh, its democracy in a point of crisis uh, last year, uh, a president who only won the election by about 2% of the vote, is focused on poverty reduction, and to go back to what I said earlier, has one foot ideologically in some of the oil nationalism and oil sovereignty rhetoric of the 20th century, as AMLO does, the whole petrolier noso. I mean, anybody who's of a certain age, I'm sorry to make this about age again, but I think there's part, part of this is true, I'm convinced. I think it explains some of AMLO's behavior too. It's how you came up. And, you know, I think from the sounds of it, Lula's very hesitant to walk away from that. Fascinating. Yeah, please. Don't I mean, if I could add something just to complicate matters even further. Please. Because uh, the one thing we're learning so far is that uh, generalizations are always inaccurate when, when it comes to Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have the issue of climate. We have the uh, oil and the differences in, in, in kind of like in the attitudes of governments related to oil. We, we heard about minerals. From Juan Carlos, let me add another layer of complexity, which is natural gas, and this is this is your area of expertise, Diego. So, natural gas is uh, it's also a different animal because um, most countries in the region are poor in terms of natural gas, and therefore are importers of natural gas, including countries that in the future could be exporters, like Brazil or Argentina. So, the national sec the, the the energy security dimension here actually makes almost every country in the region interested in developing natural gas, including, for example, Petro in Colombia. Despite the discourse related to oil, in the case of natural gas, the idea is, yes, we need to be more self-sufficient. We need to invest in exploration. We need to increase our production. Um, so natural gas, there's, there's an appetite for natural gas because it's also seen as very important in the solution of energy poverty. So. Energy transition takes a bit the back seat. We all know that uh, you know uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with natural gas are much lower than with oil and well, certainly with coal. So natural gas is 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 an area where there is a lot of interest in the region. So Argentina wants to develop uh, the pipeline connecting Baca Muerta with the port and with the uh, interior of the country where the consumption is. Brazil eventually will become an exporter of natural gas. Uh, Venezuela is uh, thinking about using the uh, facilities in Trinidad and Tobago to be able to export LNG. Colombia is very worried because the reserves of natural gas are only lasting for seven years, so we need more natural gas. Problem is, there is also a contradiction here because to produce natural gas, you you're, you know almost always need also the production of oil. It's very rare to see uh, natural gas separate than the, the production separate from, uh, from oil uh, production. So natural gas is an important issue. And here there is a tension uh, with the advanced economy because the, the advanced economies are essentially saying, 
you know, the multilateral development banks should not be involved in financing natural gas projects. Uh, but now we're saying that the world needs more natural gas, especially Europe needs more natural gas. So that's changing, that attitude is changing. So maybe we're gonna see more financing coming to, uh, to the natural gas. So this is a very complex uh, uh, scenario because you have the climate, you have the oil, you have the natural gas, and then you have all the shades possible in the region. Uh, but one element here is, uh, uh, I think we're gonna see more investment in, in natural gas uh, in, uh, in the next few years uh, than what the energy transition per se uh, would actually imply. Indeed, indeed please, Risa. No, yeah. Yeah, um, I think uh, Mauricio is hitting on something that I, I, if my students who are here are gonna hear this uh, from me, is that the energy transition is about very difficult trade-offs. Uh, and so, um, and a lot of us, so you have here, um, Mauricio, who was a public policy maker. You have Diego Mesa, who was the former minister of energy here with us as well. You have the former min minister of energy there. They all had to deal with very difficult trade-offs. Everyone wants to do the energy transition like super fast. It's the reality that hits you about energy security about energy affordability. Uh, and, and those are the things uh, that, uh, that I think we, we, we have to be very honest about this, uh, that these are trade-offs, that this is costly, that this is politically difficult, that yes, we will all want to do just solar, but it's, it's not really realistic. And so how do you try to minimize the cost, uh, but try to you know, take into account all the things that you are just talking about and that they, yes, there are contradictions and sometimes there are reversals. Um, and so how do you keep your eye on the ball? Uh, and sometimes you have to go back to go forward. And so those are the things that all of us are confronted with here at CGIP, understanding those contradictions and trying to come up with the best policy solution. And I, I think that's very interesting. And if not, then those transitions may face a backlash. And that has happened in some countries. Probably today's speech by Rishi Sunak in the UK delaying uh, some of, of the milestones is an example of that. So that's a tough uh, part of the conversation. So let's flip a little bit into geopolitics. So we know that it's fair to say that today the US and China live on a pretty, and pretty tight level of, of, of tensions, pretty much unprecedented. And Latin America is partnered to both China and the US. How, however, China has certainly uh, increased its footprint in the region in the last years. How do you see this relationship with China and what are the benefits and risks for Latin American countries of this uh, enhanced relationship with China? And probably uh, Mauricio, you, you may well, want to start. Well, thanks. We could go on and on. I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours because this is, uh, this is an exciting, relevant topic. And uh, I would just say that, especially for the students that are here, um, these are really interesting, exciting times to be a student because in the past, say, 20 to 30 years, everything was about globalization, competitiveness. And, and the, the key concept here was, where do I get the, the products that I need at the lowest cost? You know, that was like, kind of like the, 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 the mind frame. Now it's more, where do the goods come from? Not so much, you know, how much do they cost? It's like, where are they coming from? Are they coming from a place that is a secure, reliable supplier? Um, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to basically uh, make sure that our products come uh, from countries that are not going to, are not going to use this uh, as a weapon, are not going to use this uh, to challenge our status and our standards of living. I mean, these are the new concepts. So it's a, it's, it's a change in paradigm, which I think it's, it's quite relevant and quite interesting. So it's, it's, it's less economics is a bit more about geopolitics. And, uh, and that dimension you know, makes everyone interested in studying this. Uh, I, should, I think should be engaged, not just uh, in the uh, training in economics, training in energy, but you also need to know about politics. You need to know about uh, uh, history. You need to know a lot about other things that are relevant. So let me, let me say that I found these fascinating quote 
uh, from 1992. So 30 years ago, Deng Xiaoping said, the Middle East has oil. China has rare earth metals. This is 30 years ago. Wow, no? So it's like, now we're becoming a lot more aware about this and uh, we're very uh, kind of like, everyone is, is uh, we're flooded with information about the, the role of China. I just, I, I found a report um, uh, today that was just amazing, amazing. 68% of the world's cobalt is refined in China. 65% of the world's nickel is refined uh, in uh, China. 60% of the lithium is refined in China. 71% of the battery cells are produced in China. 57% of the world's electric vehicles are produced in China. And 85 to 90% of the rare earth elements um, uh, are uh, produced in China. So, I mean, this is, this is the challenge because uh, we heard Juan Carlos saying before, we will need more of this. Uh, the demand, if we want to succeed in the energy transition, and the energy transition, sorry, every five years, the consumption of these critical minerals is going to be doubling. Every five years, doubling. So it is true that the world needs to diversify the sources of critical minerals. That's absolutely true. That's why we have the RA here in the US. That's why Europe has a new law basically saying the same thing. So um, we need to essentially uh, uh, expand the, the production. And this is not easy. You just not, you not only need the mines, you need the processing. And that's the more, you know, the harder part because it requires a lot of capital. Um, so main message here, uh, this is going to be dominating uh, the conversation. I'll just end with one comment. Um, the US uh, launched uh, not long ago, last year, um, what's called, I'm gonna use the right term, the Mineral Security Partnership. The Mineral Security Partnership is essentially Europe, the US, Canada, Japan, uh, Australia. Um, Latin America is not there. So that's, that, that's something that at least should provoke uh, a reflection uh, because uh, you know that the reserves, I mean, this triangle between Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia uh, is, uh, is uh, fundamental in terms of reserves. So we, I wonder why is it that Latin America is not considered as a strategic ally in that sense? I mean, uh, what, why was it left out of this uh, alliance that was essentially uh, sponsored by the uh, US government? So I'll stop there because for some reason, the, the uh, strategic kind of like uh, historical geopolitical context of Latin America is not playing out now as a, as a strong ally uh, of, the, of the West. So Latin America is being left a little bit more in the direction of uh, receiving greater investment from China so that it fuels that, that machinery in China that processes and refines the mineral. So that's that's something that at least should ask, should provoke us to think why is that the case and what the US should do uh, if it's really interested in, in, uh, in uh, changing the balance and the equation in terms of the supply of critical minerals. Thank you, Mauricio. Lots of fun fact there. And I'm sure Juan Carlos may have a reaction for this. And if we can just keep it short, uh, Juan Carlos, to open up uh, the floor to questions later. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I think Mauricio touched on the most important things, I, I, I would say. Just a couple of concrete numbers or examples to kind of make this visual. So uh, Chile, as an example. So Chile, 55% uh, five, of residential clients get their power every day through distribution companies that are owned by Chinese companies. 55%, okay? Uh, another example, Chile exports over 50% of its copper to China that processes most of it, right? So the, the US is trying to reduce its dependence on China, on critical minerals. 
And the IRA, for example, has a, an article that says that if you want to uh, access the, the subsidies there uh, for, let's say, electric vehicles, minerals must come from friendly countries, right? Uh, but what happens with copper? What happens if the copper was mined in Chile and then was exported as concentrate to China and then was processed in China? Does that comply with the friendly country requirement? I, I don't think so. We don't know the details yet, right? So the point I'm trying to make is that this decoupling of the global or the economy or this deglobalization, to use the word Mauricio used, it's going to be very, very complicated. The global economy is a very intertwined, interconnected set of contract relations, infrastructure, that is very, it's going to be very hard to undo or to, I mean, move backwards in the tendency we moved forward in the last 30 or 50 or 60 years. Uh, and I think for Latin America, even though in, in, in many cases we have a shared set of values that probably are closer to the US and we are in the natural sphere of influence of the US, the Western Hemisphere, we have very strong trading relationships with China and other countries. And I don't think Latin American countries need to pick sizes, uh, sides, excuse me. I think we need to have a set of rules locally to screen investors or investments in a transparent and predictable way. And we need to make sure that the world has rules and institutions that basically decide how we conduct our relationships. I don't think it's good for Latin America to be kind of stuck in the middle of this tension. We need rules and institutions. And I think that is what we need to kind of help develop. Uh, a bit of a more pragmatic uh, approach. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Do you guys want to add anything else on this topic? No, I think it's to, uh, to, okay. So uh, let's have, I see quite a few uh, number of questions. You were definitely the fastest. Like a round of three. Because a round of three, okay, let's do it. So Carla has a microphone there. Carla, could you please give it to the gentleman on the Oh, great, great uh, conversation. Say your name. And oh, my name is, sort of yeah, my name is Juan Carlos Giraldo. I am from Peru, but I live in Boston. Uh, just we discussed in the terms of renewable energy, the rare earth metals that we have in Bolivia, Peru, Chile, and Argentina that are critical for the uh, renewable energy transition. Yesterday, I was in the Embassy of Denmark here in New York, and one of the panelists said something very interesting. Renewable, renewable energy is a new, is can new, um, can new market, correct? We must have the same the same incentive that fossil fuels company has. So my question is, what kind of incentives companies in Latin America, locals or internationals, should have to start a, you know, the investing in, in, the, in the country, the taxes, the bureaucracy, the corruption, et cetera. So what are your thoughts about that? Okay, thank you. We'll get um, this gentleman here, please. Um, thank you all for a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lipolis. I'm an incoming uh, postdoc at Columbia Climate School. Um, I wanted to pick up in my question on things, uh, two things that Luisa said and Mauricio said. Uh, firstly, Luisa mentioned that the fossil fuel economy is one that is export uh, intensive, right? Uh, of course, renewable energy is not export intensive in the same way, although uh, you know, technologies such as green hydrogen in a very incipient way perhaps hold some promise in that regard, right? Um, in the past few days, we had the visit of Fernando Haddad, the, the Prime Minister of Finance of Brazil, who presented his ecological transformation plans. And he mentioned the idea of exporting energy, green energy, uh, through green hydrogen, which is an ambition that is shared by other Latin American countries, as we heard, uh, but also through producing uh, so-called green manufacturing goods. Right? And this is where Mauricio's comments com comes in. So my question is, uh, two questions. To what extent is this a shared ambition, the production of green manufacturing in the rest of Latin America? And secondly, uh, what are the prospects of, of, of this idea, right? Because Mauricio mentioned that where you produce perhaps is you know, more important now, but surely competitiveness still matters. So to what extent is uh, Latin America's renewable energy matrix, uh, can it be a source of competitiveness also in manufacturing, in green manufacturing? 
thank you very much. And now, uh, maybe you behind there. We'll have run for, for another one now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Madalena Stoikov. I'm a first year at Barnard College across the street. Um, I want to go back to the topic of deforestation. Uh, you all talked a lot about the domestic, uh, environmental, and political benefits of deforestation. I was wondering if you could touch on the international political uh, benefits or if there are consequences to tackling deforestation, um, again, on the international political level. Okay, awesome. There we go. So um, who wants to start? Why don't we, uh, Diego, you want to? You want another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. because there are many hands. And then on, on the grounds of equity, the lady behind. Yeah, yeah, on the grounds of equity, <laughs> the lady behind. So two more. The lady behind? No, okay, Diego, Diego. Sorry that I'm uh, Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Olivia. I was uh, just quickly wondering, you talked a lot about Latin American countries, but you didn't touch upon the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could give just like a quick overview or analysis of how the energy transition would look like there. Thank you. Thank you. So not to expand too much, I'll maybe add to some of the questions that were made already. So on deforestation, which I think was the first point by Mauricio, um, on terms of policies. So I think, you know, we uh, everyone talks about carbon pricing and it's very efficient for energy related emissions. What type of policies uh, could be developed for reducing deforestation, which I think is a huge challenge for a lot of the countries in, in the region. And, and second, um, on this whole issue about critical minerals, again, going to the policy side. So I think one can think about at least three reactions. One that it was mentioned here before, IRA or you know, uh, very aggressive green industrial policy that we haven't seen before. Now it's in the US and in Europe. Two, you can think about some countries maybe liberalizing import restrictions just to be able to you know, bring critical minerals into the economy or export restriction, restrictions on the ones that actually produce uh, critical minerals. And, and, and to add, to tie to that is the numbers that Mauricio was given about the concentration and the processing of the different minerals, what, it's the story behind that. Why uh, we don't see more processing in other places if the critical minerals are coming from Indonesia, from DRC, from Australia. Is, is there an issue with uh, investors globally that there's some resistance to invest in processing this uh, minerals? And what policies can governments develop and implement to attract investment in, in that area? Awesome. We got a bunch of uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, shall we? Who wants to to start out? Just a recap. We got uh, incentives, green yeah. manufacturing, critical minerals, deforestation, Caribbean. Yeah, well, Carlos, probably you want to start uh, with minerals, yeah, minerals and then yeah. we go that way. Please, as, as short as as we could. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be keep it short. I'm gonna touch on, on critical minerals. My uh, my sense, Diego, is that on on critical minerals processing, the the investments required are very high, uh, at least in the in the case of copper. So copper smelting and refining needs a lot of investment. You need big scale operations. Uh, traditional mining companies are usually not interested in processing. They're interested in producing, I mean, concentrates. Um, and the, the, the smelting, and pro, I mean, refining of copper, at least, it's a very volatile market. So it's a completely different animal from mining itself. So you don't see a lot of interest from traditional mining companies. And environmental and social standards sometimes are a challenge as well. Okay, But I think governments could play a role if they think strategically we, we need to reduce our reliance on China. Uh, governments could play a, a role coordinating uh, private companies and potentially taking part of the risk to make that investments profitable. And, and I want to touch briefly on energy, clean energy manufacturing opportunities. Uh, in Chile, what we are seeing are, for example, data centers, companies that are building data centers in Chile because that needs cooling and a lot of electricity. Uh, and we have, I mean, uh, advantages there. And some people are exploring steel 
uh, plants uh, based on clean energy in, in Chile as well. And some people think that not because they are very intensive in, in electricity, but because demand is going to be big. For example, I mean, wind turbines or electrolyzers could be built in Patagonia, for example, if the green hydrogen industry takes off there, because you would have a lot of local demand. And moving around, I mean, wind turbines, for example, is very complicated. Uh, so you could see industries, I mean, being developed because you'd see, I mean, big local demand from the clean energy industry itself. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, Mauricio. Yeah. Um, so let me let me take a couple of uh, questions here. I'm going to start uh, with uh, Nicolas's point about uh, the Brazilian kind of like uh, strategy. Um, it is very hard to sell electricity to the rest of the world. It's almost impossible. It's very hard to sell hydrogen. Uh, transportation costs are just huge. Um, I mean, you can transport hydrogen, but it's very hard to do it uh, by ship. And you can transport electricity, but it's very hard to move it uh, from one continent to the other. So you need to transform that. That's, I mean, we have the advantage. We can produce clean energy. Um, we could produce the hydrogen. Certainly, we could do that. Uh, we have the elements. We have the, the clean electricity. And uh, we have the water. Um, but we need to transform that into goods. And uh, manufacturing is, of course, the natural way of thinking about this. So the, the strategy should come with what is now used, and this is the term that everyone is using, re-industrialization in, in Latin America. So now we're thinking just not in terms of the investments to produce clean energy, are, we need also to think about the investments to produce the green manufacturing, the green cement, the green steel, et cetera. So it's a bigger proposition and it involves more resources, more financing, it will involve you know, industrial policies, you involve the development banks uh, uh, getting engaged. So, uh, but this is the way to think. I think Brazil is right in pointing in this direction. Second, second, and this connects with your point and uh, uh, Diego's point about the deforestation. So if there, if, if there was a central planner for the world as a whole, someone making decisions for the entire world, the optimal decision would be, look, we need to stop deforestation. We need to start aggressively reforesting the areas that were destroyed. And this is going to capture the CO2 that we need while we solve the problem of finding the technologies that are efficient for producing cement, steel, while we uh, do the entire transformation uh, of the, uh, uh, the electrification of transportation. We, this is a technology that mother nature gave us, you know, and that is a cheaper technology to capture CO2, which is plant trees. And, uh, and, uh, and ideally this is what should happen, but this is not happening. And this is not happening because uh, the incentives are not there for the peasants in Putumayo in Colombia to say, I'm not going to deforest, I'm going to preserve because deforestation still makes them more money than the alternative. So how do you kind of like put money in their pockets so that they engage not just in avoiding deforestation, but also in reforestation? Where is the money going to come from? So here there are two, two completely opposite views. The views that are dominant now in the region are the world is going to compensate for us, that the world is going to give us the money. The advanced economy should give us the money. And this should be this should be government to government. Uh, this should be aid. This is the concept be behind the OPEC of forests. Uh, you know, we're gonna have a strong block, and we're gonna ask the advanced world to give us the money. If you look at the declaration that was signed in Belen de Pará in Brazil a few weeks ago on this topic, there is no mention to the world to the word carbon credit or carbon markets. No mention, 23 pages, no market. This is all about transfers. That's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. I mean, the, 
however interested and engaged in the climate issues is the European Union or the US government, they're not gonna send billions of dollars to compensate the Amazon countries for what they're doing for humanity. This has to be through markets, uh, but that's not the mind frame today. It has to be about selling carbon credits and it has to be about basically monetizing uh, these uh, these uh, kind of like the, the 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 resources that are there, but that's not the mind frame today in in Brazil or in Colombia at least. I mean, two of the critical players here. So we're gonna keep saying the world should compensate us, but I I really doubt that unless there is a market mechanism, that's gonna happen. So that that would be my my short answer. Thank you, Mauricio. Brian, do you want to? I mean, look, the politics of reducing deforestation are difficult, but not impossible. Um, they're difficult because, as Mauricio alluded to, you know, deforestation ends up being quite popular sometimes in the areas where it's taking place. As a matter of fact, if you study the results of the 2022 election in Brazil, some of the very strongest support that Bolsonaro had, if you look at that electoral map, it coincides with the areas that have seen the most deforestation over the last five years. Um, and that's people believing incorrectly based on everything the historical record of deforestation over the last 40 years in the Amazon tells us that deforestation will lead to a better livelihood for them. But look, I, I think there's good news on this front, which is that Brazil in particular knows how to stop deforestation. During Lula's first presidency over those eight years, there was a 75% decline in deforestation those years. And to the surprise, as I said earlier, to all of us, including I suspect Lula himself, maybe even Marina Silva, there has been this 40% plus decline this year. It's about satellite tracking. Um, it's about having environmental inspectors on the ground. Uh, Lula has also spoken, I, and this is different, I think, from some of the discourse that we heard in the 2000s, He's talked about the fact that you can't just treat deforestation as a conservation issue, that you have to find other sustainable things, sustainable products that can be derived in some way from the forest that will improve people's livelihoods because that's the only way you're gonna get the political support that you need on the ground to make that happen. So I, I'm much more optimistic than I was say even six months ago when I was worried about uh, political support on the ground, um, whether the Brazilian military was fully bought in to Lula in general, but this policy specifically. Uh, things are moving in the right direction very quickly, and let's let's hope that continues. Thank you very much, Brian. Luisa, we have you back. Yes, I'm back. So I'm going to touch on what you mentioned, um, which is this issue about uh, green hydrogen. And at the beginning, I was talking about, can we think uh, how our economies, how our institutions, banks, corporations can be part of the demand component of this. Everyone wants to export green hydrogen. Quite frankly, that's that's a difficult, difficult one. But there are um, uh, things that are very hard. There are sectors that are very hard to abate for which low carbon hydrogen is going to be the solution. So I think it's better to think about um, these kinds of new technologies that are not more as a vehicle to decarbonize those hard to abate sectors. So you export them. So you export indirectly. However, there is in the case of uh, a lot of the South American countries, uh, particularly Brazil, Argentina, there is such a compelling case to make about um, green ammonia. So part in the case of Brazil, Brazil is one of the largest importers of ammonia fertilizers, right? You know where Brazil gets this from? Russia. So talk about a exchange rate, uh, you know, reduction of your uh, 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 currency. So uh, ex hard currency uh, dollars are something that everyone wants, right, in emerging markets. So this is one in which you don't export it, you just reduce your imports. But this is such a compelling case from a geopolitical standpoint. I think it's uh, it makes it one of the ways in which greening your economy, greening your agricultural sector, talk also about agriculture, it actually is reduces geopolitical risks uh, and it's an overall, it's an obvious need. So we need to think about in a lot of green energy technologies, the problem is to be frank, um, in some cases, not in solar and wind, but in some cases, 
it's higher priced, right? Uh, and so the problem is that you don't have the demand on the other side because nobody wants to pay more than the fossil fuel substitution, right? And so how do we create markets so that we can uh, do exactly what happened with solar and wind, which is the price comes down so that it's scalable. And so those are the things in which I think the region uh, should think a little bit more also about this kinds of uh, solutions. And in relation to uh, the quest another question about subsidies, the it's very clear Latin America doesn't have the balance sheet to do what the Inflation Reduction Act did, uh, but we have other tools. Uh, so an example of that is Brazil developed a biofuels uh, industry quite successfully just with mandates. So the idea of mandates is something that I think we have to integrate. So you use policy. And, and I heard that, um, actually, Diego, I, I, Diego Mes, I heard you uh, say that uh, in, uh, in one panel as well, uh, about the use of policy as a, um, as a tool uh, to increase competitiveness. So what you don't have from your balance sheet perspective, you use uh, with, your, um, with the different regulations and policies, and you create policy innovation. And so, which is why I do think that the politics sometimes gets in the way of the energy transition in Latin America, um, because energy transition is a bet on institutions. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, um, uh, and, and technical capabilities and, um, and uh, your bureaucracy, technical bureaucracy, not politicized bureaucracy, and sometimes there's a divide uh, uh, there uh, between different ideologies. And so you cannot have the willingness without the execution. So in some cases you have the willingness to do the energy transition, but you lack the execution uh, because, because you actually have an ideological divide about what technical, what energy transition looks like from, a, from an actual perspective. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I would love to have more space for questions, but I know we're 10 minutes past. So I'm afraid we'll need to wrap up. Uh, yeah, or do you? Um, you want to Is there like one or two burning questions? Yeah. Yes, you've yeah. been. We won't be offended if you leave. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for a very insightful panel. I'm Luisa. I'm a representative of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition that was formed to support the Secretary General. And my question is, we do not listen a lot about the challenge of energy poverty in the continent. So when you listen to multilaterals, and I don't see a lot of investments going that way. So my question is, how are we gonna resolve that challenge? Uh, what are the business models? What can we do about energy poverty in the in the region? Thank All you. Right. Thank you. And I know, gentlemen, there are you being? Could you could you just walk in if whatever? Hi again. Thank you so much, uh, Ardalan Tajali. I'm an investor and banker here in the city. Um, I guess one of the um, quotes that I really appreciated at the beginning, but would like to revisit, was one of you said um, essentially that we shouldn't tax the rents on the uh, natural endowments that we have. We should tax the growth generated from those rents, which as a banker, I fully subscribe to. <laughs> um, but I guess my question is, if we are not raising the cost of capital on carbon emissions, from these uh, natural resources, how do we funnel that growth towards carbon reduction and or industries and technologies that will aid the energy transition? So, okay, just like a couple. Uh, there, there, I mean, there was one That's, last one, yeah. Yeah. perhaps. Okay, let's. Uh... Oh. Keep it short, Ricky. Hi, my name is Ricky. Uh, I am a business development analyst at Blackcore Energy. Uh, my question has to do with, um, I know in the Salton Sea in Southern California, there's a lot of activities in terms of using geothermal to mitigate the uh, negative impacts of mining, lithium and other uh, resources. I'm wondering like how promising do you think geothermal is in Latin America in terms of mitigating uh, these, these environmental harms? And related to that, another potential way of mitigating these harms is through the sheer uh, reduction in demand. So, for example, I used to work on uh, state level uh, EV policy here in the US. There's a lot of debate in terms of like whether we should just electrify all the personal use vehicles or do more about transit. So I'm wondering like how that debate uh, is going on in Latin America in general. Thank you. Uh, 
I think we owe an, an answer to the question on the Caribbean. And the student who answered the question is leaving. <laughs> so I, I think we should tackle the issue of the Caribbean. De definitely. Uh, because you asked a question about the Caribbean and you Please. deserve you deserve an answer. So I don't know. I mean, I I I, I think it uh, the panel has reflected a little bit of our own national origins and biases. Um, but if I were to say three words about the Caribbean is point number one, uh, the whole region uh, is very exposed to the effects of climate change. But within the region, the Caribbean is the most exposed part of the of these uh, of these uh, hemisphere. So there are very good reasons to be worried about the Caribbean. Two, the Caribbean is, I mean, except for, for Trinidad and Tobago, is very energy poor. So it's not a region that produces fossil fuels. Um, and, and it's a region that uh, uh, can actually benefit a lot from the energy transition by producing more solar uh, wind energy. So I think, um, there, there are good reasons to be optimistic about the Caribbean um, because it can actually solve one of the problems is dependence on, on, on imported fossil fuels. And if the world really at large reduces emissions and reduces the challenges associated with climate change, the, the, the Caribbean is gonna be in a better position in terms of exposure to extreme weather events. So uh, that to say that is not surprised to see uh, politicians and leaders uh, such as uh, Mia Motley, the prime minister from Barbados, being at the forefront of these conversations. And, uh, and luckily for, for all of us uh, in the right direction. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to see uh, the, the leadership that is coming from the Caribbean in this, in this sense. Let me tackle the um, energy. So, um, the energy poverty issue. Um, so uh, when we look at where uh, the future of energy demand is going to be, it's obviously in emerging markets, um, and most importantly in Asia Pacific, uh, just because of sheer growth, um, but also in Latin America. Latin America actually has to invest more in solar to remain, uh, to continue to have its share of renewables this high, uh, just because of sheer uh, uh, demand. Um, in Africa, for example, uh, the demand uh, of energy is not only coming from growth, but from penetration, from access to energy. So the region remains, um, so uh, yes, there's energy poverty in the region, and a lot of the discussions about how much uh, the energy transition is going to cost is also to enlarge or, or to increase access to energy. But that is not the main issue. Um, the main issue is the uh, not only the only issue, is reliability of energy. And so a country like Venezuela says that it has, you know, 100% energy uh, uh, integration or access, and people have 100% energy access. Uh, okay, um, the issue is really more about reliability, you know, <laughs> to have really sure energy. So it's uh, uh, more, it's much more complex. Um, so um, I think the other question was about... Uh, I, can, I can say a word on geothermal. Uh, energy efficiency. The IRENA believes that out of the 1.6 trillion per year, it's the IA, 1.6 trillion per year that uh, it needs to, 2.5 trillion per year that needs to go to emerging markets and developing economies. Um, when you look at where the energy is five uh, globally, but emerging markets is uh, like 2.5, 2.6. So it's more than half, right? And so we're not mobilizing this enough. And so we have to think about how to do this. They actually say that energy efficiency has a significant, is as important as electrification. And so it's a, we're not thinking a lot about this. And so there's a lot of issues about just transition. Um, I completely understand that, but it is not possible uh, for the emerging markets and developing economies to continue to grow in this way without significantly reducing the energy intensity and energy efficiency is uh, what uh, enters into that. So we have to think about ways in which uh, we deploy less capital uh, in terms of reducing our energy intensity. And then there was another question on geothermal that I know Juan Carlos may have a couple last words uh, for that. Yeah, very briefly, because we don't have time. What I've seen in geothermal in Chile, 
Chile has an enormous geothermal potential, but steel is more expensive than the alternatives. So it provides, I mean, reliable base load power. It's renewable. It's mostly, I mean, clean, but it's still more expensive than, let's say, a combination of solar and batteries. Uh, but if the cost goes down, I think it's it's a very good alternative. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Are, are you going to do another round? No, 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 because I, I was going to answer your question about the rents. So Luisa said something before, which I, I think it's, uh, it's fascinating and it's, it's the beginning of a much broader con uh, conversation, which is the energy transition is intensive in institutions. You need, you, know, you need strong institutions. You need the ability of government to do things, to do policies, industrial policies. You need you know, big investments. The energy transition is also very intensive in fiscal capacity, in the ability of governments to put money in the hands of the people that are going to solve this. That's the IRA. That's what Europe is doing. We need money for ending deforestation. It really needs a lot of public resources. Oil generates rents because oil is, you know, there's a big gap between the cost of uh, lifting a barrel of oil and the cost and the price that you're going to get in the market. So there's a rent. And the rent can be captured through taxation, through royalties, or the fact that you own the state owned enterprise. But that's where the money is. And if you think these state owned enterprises have been there for a long time, Petrobras, Ecopetrol, they have capacity. They have, to, they have the capacity to do the projects, they have the capacity to uh, you know, hire the engineering firms. They have the capacity to develop, and they are the ones that did the petrochemical sector. Uh, they went into biofuels in some cases. So that capacity is needed. So that's why the conversation comes back to the state-owned enterprises as, as a key vehicle to implement a lot of what is necessary during the, or for the energy uh, transition. So I think, Taxation, royalties, state-owned enterprises are, are, are necessary for, for one reason, which is, you know, to do this, we need financing. Governments increase their level of debt as a result of the pandemic. This is global. So we cannot pile more debt. And, and therefore, you know, uh, we, need, we need the resources uh, and, and I think this is, in, in my view of things, this is a good way of rationalizing why Lula is saying what he's saying. We need Petrobras, we need the oil, we need the offshore, because I think he understands ultimately that without these resources, the states are gonna be very weak and therefore they're gonna be unable to do the uh, transition. The opposite view is, is the view of Colombia, which is, well, the world's gonna give the money to us. And I think that's just being too optimistic, perhaps uh, to the point of being naive. Well, thank you very much. I think this just highlights how difficult are the challenges ahead and the questions. And yes, please, uh, let's give a clap to our amazing family. And thank you very much to you, our audience, especially to those of you that stay here to the very end, to those survivors on the Zoom. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to our team and all, all the technical staff. And um, please, there are more events coming. Can you check out to our website and the full recording of the event will be also available in, in the website in days to come. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>